All right, Biology 11 students, welcome back. Our next topic is the evidence for evolution. Um, we just watched in the video that, uh, you know, even though Darwin's idea of natural selection to explain evolution is bang on and, and seems to have a ton of evidence backing it, um, back in the day, people weren't so ready to just admit that humans were not made in the image of God, that humans were just animals, and uh, we didn't have a special place in uh, the animal kingdom or in life itself. So, um, Darwin really had to fight to uh, back up his words, right? As any new idea should, right? Anytime we come out with a new way of explaining something, and it's very, very important, and it holds you know, big scientific and societal impacts, the person should have to back that up, right? So we're gonna go over today some of the things Darwin used to back up his argument, the case for natural selection to explain evolution, and some of the things um, that have come out since that have added even more evidence to uh, the case for evolution by natural selection. So let's go through our list here. So there's eight things that we're going to talk about in terms of evidence for evolution. There's the big three and then five more supporting ones. And the first three are the big three. The fossil record, homologous structures, and embryology. Those were huge for Darwin. Now, geographic distribution helped. Molecular biology, that's kind of a new one. Chromosomal action, kind of a new one. Protective resemblance and artificial selection also helped Darwin. But those first three were the big three. All right, so we're going to spend more time on those than, than we will on the other ones. So our first one, the fossil record. So the study of fossils and the fossil record is paleontology. So if you're a paleontologist, you do that. And then you saw in that movie, um, Owen. Owen was a biologist uh, and he was an expert in anatomy, but he was also a paleontologist. So that's why he got to look at the bones that Darwin brought back over from around the world. And he was explaining this was a you know large rat-like creature. This was like a giant sloth and things like that. So... He's an expert in, in anatomy and paleontology, so he was able to paint a picture of what those fossils looked like. Fossils provide some of the strongest pieces of evidence, right? We talked about before how, you know, if, if me and you are standing on the earth here, right? The earth is made of layers of rock, and the lowest ones are the oldest layers of rock formed way, 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 way long ago, and this is a relatively newer layer of the earth or rock more recently formed and what we saw were fossils in the fossil record that maybe even resemble something today we saw this diagram I drew the similar thing when we talked about catastrophism with Cuvier and what we notice is kind of a flow form in some areas of the fossil record where even that thing looks like that right so this fossil, you know what? If we lengthen that, shorten this, thicken that, change this, it could look like that. A few modifications, and it could look like this. And then a few modifications, and maybe it becomes this. You know, this is not too far from that. And then, you know, we work our way up to, you know what? That looks like that thing that's walking around on the planet today. So this is what the fossil record does through petrified remains, imprints, microfossils, preserved specimens, fossilized bones, we see these patterns. Now, the fossil record is not complete. So what that means is that there are areas in the fossil record that for one reason or another are missing, right? Probably some catastrophic geological event volcanic activity, an earthquake, whatever it happens to be, there are areas in these chains, this flow form, that happen to be missing, all right? They're not there. And we refer to these missing links as, well, missing, missing links. And 
And so that's why you hear about the term missing link when we talk about fossils or evolution, is that without this link here to complete and fulfill the chain, you can't say this became that. There's no way of saying it, right? Um, again, science demands that you can totally prove it. So there may, there may be a missing link in this lineage. And then we go to a lineage for another creature. There's a missing link or two in there. Another missing link in that lineage. These missing links are all throughout the fossil record. They're not numerous when I say all throughout. It's not like they're all over the place. But there are enough of them where you can't entirely say, even though it makes a whole lot of sense, you can't entirely say that creature A led to creature B. If you have creature you know, A point, you know, 2.0 in the middle here, then you could say A becomes B, right? Um, and so that's it. So what we see with the fossil record, the big term is flow of form. And again, the flow is just enough slight changes as we go through which is kind of supported by the early ideas of actualism and uniformitarianism, which said the earth and the environment would have changed slowly. So again, over millions of years, and that's what these layers of rock would be, millions, perhaps even billions of years old, they would see that slow change that maybe leads to the common everyday creature today. All right, so that's the fossil record. So we look here, this diagram that's in your notes looks at skulls of modern day cats including th not, not only your house cat but lions and tigers and such and ancient cats like saber-toothed tigers and stuff like that and you can see the resemblance in all of the skulls all right so obviously there would be something common to all of these things that would link them together there must be some common ancestor to all of these cats that had this framework this pattern for their skull and it's being passed on to all the species that came from that one branch, that one common species of cat. And of course, I found this little meme online. You know, we have the fossils, we win. Um, fossils are a very, very strong piece of evidence that creatures can change over time. Um, we see that. Homologous structures is the next one. Now, structure just means a physical form on the body. Homologous means the same, right? Whenever we see the, the root homo, it means the same. We talked about homologous chromosomes, like the number one chromosome you get from mom, the number one chromosome you get from dad. They both carry the same genetic information as far as the genes go. They could have different forms of the genes, but they have the same genes. They're the same size. So homologous means similar, the same. So homologous structures <clears throat> excuse me, are parts of the body found on sometimes very different looking species. And even though the species look very different, the structures inside of them or that make them up can look very similar. All right? So the outside carrying case, if you think about it, the outside case of this creature looks different from another one. But inside, there's these structures that look remarkably alike. And they may have entirely different functions. So how is this showing some sort of common ancestry, right? Well, if you think about it, if I find a structure on creature A that's similar to something on creature B, right? That structure is encoded for by the DNA of creature A and creature B, right? And where do we get our DNA from? Well, we get it from our parents. Right? The P1 generation, if we're calling these the F1, the sons and daughters of these guys. And where do they get it from? They get it from the P2. Then they get it from the P3, your great-grandparents, and so on and so forth. Eventually, it's possible that there is a common ancestor that has diverged and formed two populations. So from this ancestral population, we have formed two separate, different-looking populations. But the structure... From this common ancestor is still found in both all right all it means is that you know then why do they look different it just means that this could be living in an environment that requires it to look a certain way to survive to achieve all the check marks on mother nature's checklist and this one has moved into a different environment so there were some modifications and adaptations that had to be made 
to thrive in that environment, to get their checklists fulfilled. So that's all that that means. It, re it goes back to there being a common ancestor that had this part and that ancestral population gave rise to the A population of creatures and the B population of creatures, right? What we're going to look at is a couple of really good diagrams here that show, show the forelimb of some mammals. <clears throat> Actually, some of these aren't even mammals, but it shows the forelimb, which would be your, your front leg, or on you if you're on down all fours, it would be your arms. All right, so if we look here, now it doesn't, it's small here, of course, this is your note from the D2L page. Um, you can look at it and, and enlarge it, you know, or hopefully you print it off in your notes, or you can just look at it online on your computer. But what I like about this one is it takes a whole bunch of different creatures, right? So this one is looking at a penguin, so a bird, an alligator, a reptile, a bat, which is a mammal, and a human being. And it looks at the, of course, the front arm, which in a penguin is a flipper used for swimming, the alligator used for crawling around on the ground and swimming, the bat for flight and for us or a whole ton of things. And it color codes the bones, right? So we see the humerus, which extends down from the shoulder. That's in green. Then the radius and ulna, which are in your forearm, they're right beside each other and they're pink and purple. And then we see the tars, uh, the, sorry, um, the carpals, the metacarpals and the phalanges, right? Carpals are your wrist, metacarpals the back of the hand, the phalanges are your fingers. So we see all these things color-coded. And even though they do look a little bit different, the arrangement is very similar. The pattern repeats. And same thing down here, the bones are color-coded. It doesn't correlate to these colors, but we can still see the humerus, the radius, and ulna, and it shows the carpals and metacarpals and phalanges are the same. But here's a cat. Here's a whale, and here's a bat. So again, four totally different looking creatures, but we see that same body plan in all four of them. All right? So that again denotes, well, if our traits and our building pattern, you know, our blueprint is our DNA, it means that if we go back, there had to be some creature that had that blueprint that has given it to both of these different, very different in some cases, populations. And there's another larger diagram, again, showing a human, a horse, human, horse, cat, bat, bird, and whale. And it's the forelip. Now, there's two other types of structures that we'll talk about. One helps out with evolution, not as much as homologous structures, but still helps out quite a bit. And the other one does not, all right? So vestigial structure. Basically, a vestigial structure is a remnant or a leftover from our evolutionary past, which means at one point maybe we did need it, but we don't anymore. So now it's being reduced to a smaller structure that's probably not even used, right? Um, so we use that as evidence because it kind of points back to, well, what did we used to do, right? It gives us an example. So inside of a human being, we have the human appendix. The appendix is there, Right? And some people it gets infected and can cause a lot of pain. It has to be cut out. Right? You don't want your appendix to burst because then you get peritonitis. Appendicitis becomes peritonitis, and that's a whole lot more of a higher level of trouble. Um, and then the hind digit on a dog. Right? Dogs have this little stub on the back of their legs, which doesn't seem to do anything, right? It's kind of like our thumb, only it's back in our arm a bit. These are vestigial structures. They're in us and they're on us but we don't use them anymore. But one of our ancestors probably did. Now, analogous structures are the opposite of homologous. So I'll write this down. Homologous structures, these are the ones, same structure, and it may have a different function. All right? So like the forelimb of a whale is used for swimming, right? The forelimb of a horse is used for walking, right? The forelimb of a bat is used for flight. They all have similar structures, but their functions are different, all right? Analogous is the exact opposite. Analogous structures have the same function
but the structures are different. All right. So this one is good for evolution, right? So in terms of showing evolution, this one does. This one does not, sh it's not proof of evolution. But I wanted to explain them. The two ideas sometimes get, where well, you can see why they would get switched back and forth. Now, analogous structures are not an example of evolution, right? If I look at a bird's wing and a butterfly wing, the function is the same. It's flight. But if I look at a bird's wing, there's bones in there, there's musculature in there, there's um, nerves in there, right? Feathers, all of that stuff. A butterfly wing is very, very thin, filamentous, and, and it has little scales on it, right? That, you know, these brightly colored scales are why butterflies look so bright and, and, and you know, colorful in their wings. So even though the function is the same, the structures are very different. Well, the structures are what we get from our DNA. That shows relationship. These structures don't look like each other at all. They have very different genetic codes, which so they don't support a familial or, you know, a, a, a similarity based on relationship to a common ancestor. So we look here, the femur. The femur on your body extends from your hip down to your knee. It's the longest bone in the body, right? So the femur goes again from your hip down to your knee. Very important for you if you're walking around. Very, very important, right? And the femur in a whale is just being reduced to this bone. So it's back there, but of course whales don't have hind legs, right? So they don't use it. It's slowly withering away. They don't need it. Human structures, muscles to move our ears. Now, if we were in class, I would ask, you know, who in here could move their ears? And there's always one or two students that can really move their ears, right? And of course, then we find the mutants and we put an end to them. No, I'm just kidding, we don't do that. But um, I'm always amazed at how well some people can move their ears. I'm not that good at it at all. Um, if we look, of course, there are appendixes down here. Uh, the caudal vertebrae, the tailbone, right? We used to have tails. We don't anymore. So a lot of these things are starting to disappear. The nictitating membrane on the eye here is that little flap of tissue in the inner corner of the eye. Um, back when we lived in the water, if you think about your frog dissection from grade 10, the nictitating membrane was under the eyelid and it would cover over the eyes when the frog swam, all right? And so it was like uh, having goggles on so you could see underwater better and your eyes would be protected from the grit and the silt in the water. Um, our nictitating membrane is, is reduced to this little flap because, of course, we don't live an aquatic lifestyle anymore, right? So those are vestigial. They point to evolutionary past. Here's some analogous structures. So we've got two birds here, or sorry, a bat and a bird. These are homologous. But if I look at the insect wings, these look like dragonfly wings here. They don't have any of the same structures that these two have in common. So these two, the bat and the bird, are homologous structures, and the dragonfly is vestigial. Same function, flying, but very different architecture inside of them. And then the shark and the dolphin have some similar things. If you look at the pectoral fin, right, and the dorsal fin, right, they both have those the ocean, right, says it's a good thing. It helps you move around. So they both developed it, even though one is chondrichthys, uh, some diversity, and one is a mammal, right? So embryology is our next one of the big three. I'm taking more time to go over these, these big three. Uh, ology means study of, and of course, embryo means embryos it's one of our prenatal stages and you know and being an embryo so embryology is a study of embryonic development in seemingly unrelated very different species and what happens is if you go back to the early embryonic stages a lot of different things look pretty much the same right they've got gill slits um, even the ones that live on land they've got an elongated tail a large eye spot and, and you look and go like, well, that's a rabbit, that's a tortoise, that's a bird, that's a human, they all look the same if you go far enough back. 
And then what happens is, if you could take all these different embryos, for example, let's say we took, you know, five or six different embryos. There's creature A and B and C and D and E, and they were very different. You know, this is a human, that's a bird, this is a rabbit, this is a, you know, an alligator, this is a fish. What happens is, at one point, they all look remarkably the same, these little embryos in the Petri dish. And if you could take a picture of them every couple of hours until they were fully formed, what you kind of see is, it's like evolution, the development of the new traits, the divergences, the, you know, the becoming different, right, the change over time. But it would be like in fast forward. Instead of millions and millions of years, it would be more like within, you know, several weeks or several months. So I have a picture here. It's a very famous picture. Um, these are various embryonic stages that were drawn. Of course, not actual pictures, because this is a, a very old, you know, this picture was taken very long time ago, uh, or drawn a very long time ago, but it's, it's an excellent picture. So in the picture, I see a fish, a salamander, so an amphibian, a tortoise, a reptile, a chicken, which is a bird, and then we see a pig, a cow, a rabbit, and a human, right? All vertical, so human, and rabbit and what you can see is at the top in the early embryonic stages they all look exactly the same pretty much and then if you look they go a little bit further in time you see the fish and the salamander who both have an aquatic part of their life cycle they still look remarkably the same the tortoise and the chicken the reptile and the bird we talked about them in diversity one becoming the other the reptiles you know leading way to the birds evolving into birds some of them they still look remarkably the same. And then we have our four mammals, which look remarkably the same. The pig, the cow, the rabbit, and the human still look the same. So given some time, we see our aquatic species diverging from our reptiles and birds, and then our mammals diverging from them. We see the differences, even though within the groups, they still look the same. Go forward another number of weeks or days, and we can see now the fish looks very much like a fish. The salamander is still there. The bird and the, sorry, the tortoise and the bird still look a lot alike, but I can see the shell developing. And I can see feet instead of the flappy wings here. And then, of course, our mammals still look a lot alike. All right, quite a bit. Um, here's a larger picture, very similar here. This one shows more species. It has eight. This one only has six. But I've got a fish, a salamander, a tortoise, um, a chicken, and a rabbit, and a human being. And you can still see the same resemblance. Earlier on, we all look the same. Some divergences take place. Our terrestrial species look different than our two aquatic species. And then, of course, we can see all of the differences, like the beak, the shell, flippers instead of, you know, hands and feet. And then, of course, the same things are going on here. We see the divergences that would take place over time. It's like one of those flip books that have drawings in the corner and as you flip the book, you know, the, the person is running or they're doing something, you know, it animates them. If we could take those pictures every hour or two of these things developing, it would be like a flip book movie of evolution, you know, in fast forward. Our next one is molecular biology. Now, of course, back in Darwin's day, we did have microscopes, but they weren't quite what they are today. So molecular biology refers to, well, biology is living things, the study of living things. Molecular is the molecules that make them up. So these are the building blocks of life. And there's four types. There's the carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. Now we know what some of these things do. Carbs are for energy, right? So carbs, that's our body's primary source of energy. Proteins, right? They do things like enzymes. And enzymes run chemical reactions, all right? Um, nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are things like DNA, deoxyribo, nucleic acid, and RNA. And we know that they are genetic code and protein building. Now, if I go into a human being, you know, if I could shrink down and, and go inside of a body of a human being and watch what these things do, the carbs would be processed for energy. This is glucose, right? The fundamental fuel of all living things. Proteins would be working as enzymes, running reactions, 
turning these into those, adding these things together to build. Whatever happens you know, to, to be done, proteins are probably doing that. They're the working molecules of the body. If I go into your body, I could see DNA being the genetic blueprint and RNA being used as a copy of a gene to go out and help ribosomes build proteins, right? Now, if I did the same thing, only I went to the body of a dog or a fungus or an apple tree, these things are still doing the same jobs. And in fact, those four same bases in DNA, DNA had adenine paired up with thymine and cytosine paired up with guanine. And it had the double helix shape. So it had this sort of shape to it, right? We looked at this in class. The DNA of mold would have this shape and these pairings. The DNA of uh, fox, this shape, that pairing. The DNA of a pineapple tree, this shape, those pairings, this job. And same with these other things. So there has to be some sort of connection amongst all living things. Their structures and their functions are very similar in all different sorts of things. So this has to show some sort of a connection. Um, again, if we want to bring lipids into lipids or fats, right? Our cell membrane is made of lipids. And the cell membranes of, well, your body, a dog or cat body, a tree, a fungus, a bacteria, those cell membranes are all made of the same things, phospholipids. So there has to be some link between all living things. We're all made of the same materials. And they all act the same. Chromosomal action. Chromosomes, we know, are DNA in a tightly coiled and condensed form, easy to move about the cell. And we looked at this movement earlier on in the class, and you also looked at it in grade 10 when we did mitosis. And so chromosomes, well, what happens? Well, the DNA doubles just before the cell divides. That happens in me, happens in you, it happens in your dog, it happens in fish, it happens in alligators, it happens in plants, it happens in fungi, right? Then what do the chromosomes do? Well, they get in their pairs, and then they move to the middle of the cell. So prophase happens, all right? We form the chromosomes in prophase, they go to the middle of the cell in metaphase, and then they're pulled apart in anaphase. And then the cell pinches in, and, and we form two new cells in telophase, and cytokinesis occurs. So that happens in everything. If we look at cell division in an armadillo, that's the way it works. If we look at cell division inside of a, a peach tree, that's the way it works. If we look at cell division inside of a, um, an amoeba, that's how it happens, right? So all creatures, big and small, have the same pattern, right? And so here's prophase, right? The chromosomes form, they pair up, they go to the middle, they're pulled apart, and then telophase, the pinching in and the division, right? And so these actions take place in everything. So there has to be some sort of link between them. Geographic distribution. Now, there's two ways to look at geographic distribution. There's geographic distribution that uses the past, and then there's geographic distribution that uses the present. All right? Now, geography is landforms, looking at different continents and countries and mountain ranges and all of this. Um, distribution is how things are handed out or placed out, you know, where we'll find them. So distribu uh, distribution refers to where they've been placed or where we find them. So... If we look at geographic distribution of the past, we find fossils that are similar. So it means the same creature, right? So, oh boy, that was bad. Fossils that are similar, but now we find them in very unsimilar environments. Why? If I look at the coasts of South America, rich, lush, tropical rainforest and beaches, and then the coast of continental Africa, depending where I'm at, it could be a desert. 
and yet I'm finding fossils of a very similar creature. Now, if creatures have to fit their environment, how is the rainforest creature looking exactly like a desert creature when those checklists, the checklist to survive in a rainforest and the checklist to, to survive in a desert, would be very, very different? Well, that's because at one point they were once beside each other, right? You guys have probably learned about the the um, supercontinent Pangaea. Long, long time ago, all the continents were together as one big, large supercontinent. And so those coastlines would have been together. So again, here's what I'm talking about. There's South America and there's Africa. So it's possible a creature would have lived in this area here. But over time, what happened was that population got split as the land moved apart. So as South Africa and, uh, and um, South America got pulled apart, that population got pulled apart. The environments became separated and they went through their own different unique changes which means the creatures would have responded with their own unique different adaptations and so nowadays creatures in south america and this just shows kind of a time lapse of the separation so creatures in south america here look quite different than the creatures of africa now but if you go and look at fossils some of them look remarkably the same this shows again the supercontinent shows several creatures in a plant and it shows where we find their fossils or where we have found their fossils. And so this thing here that looks very much like a crocodile, we find in the southern tips of both South America and Africa, which are very different from each other now. All right? This plant they found in Australia, the Antarctic, the bottom of Africa, and the bottom of South America. Again, very different environments, but at one point they had a similar environment. They were very close to each other. Their climates, their environments are very similar. So that's of the past, right? And Pangea is going to be a key point there. Supercon, and I'll write that in for you. Pangea, did I write that correctly? I think I did. Let's see. Crazy shirt. I didn't have that A in there. Anyway. So, using the present. Now, if I look at the present day, geographic, landform, distribution, where the creatures are put out amongst the land. If I look at mountain ranges, and I go into the Rockies, right? The Rockies are a huge mountain range, extend down from Canada right into the States. Um, I think through the States, almost into Mexico, if I, if I remember correctly. Anyway, you've got the Rockies there. Um, Massive mountain range. There are mountain creatures. The environment in the mountains is very specific and you need certain traits to survive. Now, if I go on the coast of BC or the interior plans, uh, plains of BC, those creatures don't look like the mountain creatures, right? So if I draw that, here's what that kind of would look like. There's my water. Here's my coastline of BC. So I got Vancouver and Victoria. And then I've got the Rockies here, right? All those mountains. And then I've got the interior of BC, and then we've got the prairies and all of that, and Ontario would be over here somewhere. The creatures here, right, these creatures, they don't look like these ones, and they don't really look like those ones. All right? But if I go to another continent and look at another mountain range, so if I go down to South America, this is Canada, say, and I go down to South America... And I look at the mountain ranges there. The Andes are the mountains there. You remember them from the movie, Darwin's Dangerous Idea. If I go to there, I find creatures living here in the Andes have more in common with the rocky creatures here than they do with the Amazon basin that are here. So I'm finding mountain creatures that are similar thousands and thousands of miles apart, and they're more similar to each other than they are to the neighboring creatures. And that's because every environment... Mother Nature has her own checklist. Ladies and gentlemen, here's what you got to do today to survive. The creatures in the mountains have very similar checklists. So they've developed very similar body plans to meet those needs, to catch their food, to not be food for someone else, to find a mate, to find water, to get a place to live or build a place to live. So these two creatures, mountains here and mountains there, look a lot more alike than these two creatures in some cases that are right beside each other but very different environmental conditions so this shows a very strong link to the environment 
and what you're going to look like and how you're going to cope. All right, if we brought the Himalayas in here, another mountain range, we'd see Himalayan creatures that are like the Andes creatures, which are like the Rockies creatures, right? So in this point just says, often we'll see, you know, the relationship between these two seems a lot closer than ones in neighboring communities, even though they're right next to each other, very different environments. So it shows the impact of environmental selection, the environment and mother nature saying, you're good to live here, you're not. And when those environments are very similar, we'll find very similar things. Here are some placental mammals that are found in various parts of the world. And here are their Australian cousins. Australia's a, a wicked, wicked continent. I would love to go there because they've got, they've got desert. They've got mountain ranges. They've got coastal areas. They've got rich tropical forests all on this one island continent. So if we go around the world and we find different, different placental mammals, we find their marsupial mammal cousins in Australia. And we see very similar body plans. The ecological niche or role that these guys play is fulfilled by these marsupials, right? These guys couldn't get there because, well, it's an island and they couldn't make it across the water. So these mammals that were there have kind of developed similar body plans and tactics that have fulfilled that ecological role in, uh, in Australia. And there's an example of giant anteater-like creatures on different continents. The checklists of the environments they live in are very similar and they've developed very similar body plans. Protective resemblance. Protective resemblance means in order to survive, you have to look like something. And there's a very famous case uh, of the peppered moth in England, right? So the peppered moth in England, it had two forms. Um, it, it was found in birch forest, so forest filled with lots of birch trees. Now, if you remember the birch tree, that's the one that's got this grayish white color to it. Um, there were the light colored peppered moths, which were about the same color as the birch trees, a very light whitish gray. And then there were the dark versions of the peppered moth, right? The dark ones looked very dark gray, almost black. And so they lived in these birch forests. So the moth had a light and dark form. So these would be just different alleles, right? And so what happened was the light ones dominated in the forest, right? So if we went into the forest and we looked at the two moths, the light version might make up 80% of the moths that you see. The dark version would be 20% of the moths, right? You're thinking, well, why would that be? Well, the dark ones, remember when moths try to hide from a predator, what they basically do is they go up on a surface and they just remain totally still. Now, if you're a light-colored moth on the light-colored birch bark, you might not be noticeable. And you hide very well, and you survive. You reproduce and pass on your light-colored genes. The dark-colored moths, they would do the same thing. It's an instinct. Oh my God, there's a bird. It's going to eat me. And it goes over to the tree and freezes. But again, because of its coloration, the alleles that it has... The form of the gene for wing color it sticks out really badly right you can imagine two bears up in the arctic you've got a polar bear and a grizzly bear right from northern canada it just went up a little too far north the polar bear hides very well it can eat things because it can sneak up on them it blends in the grizzly bear is big and brown you're going to see that coming from a mile away in the snow and the ice of the arctic right same thing here. These guys hide really, really well. These guys do the same thing to hide, but they stand out. Right? Now, interesting thing happens. The Industrial Revolution happens. In the Industrial Revolution, what we do is we build factories. And factories put out smoke and soot. And the environmental protection in those days wasn't quite as strong as it is now. Right? So all these factories are being built in certain areas. And nearby you would still have the, the forests, right? All the trees grown nearby. Now what they found is in forests that were far enough away from the factory. So these forests, there are no factories built around them. 
that ratio of light to dark peppered moths, it stayed the same. These ones have an advantage in this environment when it comes to hiding from predators. These ones are at a disadvantage. The stands of force that were near the industrial facilities where the soot and the ash started to cover some of the trees, those trees got slightly darker trunks. And so now what they noticed was before that, the naturalists went, well, it's about 80 to 20. But then after the factories were built, they saw this. There is a shift in the population, a change in that population of peppered moths. Now the light ones, who had the advantage before, were now at a disadvantage on the darker colored trees, and the dark ones were thriving. Their numbers went way up. Because when a bird came by, they did the same thing. They froze, attached to the side of the tree, and pfft, there you go. The dark ones could now blend in. So what we saw was a, a term called genetic drift. The gene frequencies, the light gene and the dark gene, right? Different alleles, like tall and short for pea plants or purple flowers, white flowers, right? There's genes that control wind color. And we saw a drift or a shift in their frequency from 80% to 20 for light and 20 to 80. Yet, where the environment didn't change because there were no factories built, it stayed the same as it was before, which showed that environmental change has an impact on the survival, which is based on your genes, right? So all of those things are linked together. Environment, survival rate, genetic frequency, they're all interlinked, they're all related. So here's what I was talking about. Here's our normal birch tree, and I'll point them out because I know the picture's small, you can enlarge it at your own computer at home. There's a light colored moth on a light tree. And there's a dark moth. So I'm a, if I'm a bird, I mean, I can see it from here easily. I'm going to see that one. There's a moth shape. This one I might not see. On the dark tree, the dark moth is here. You can hardly see him. The light one's right here, kind of standing out. So this is like our factory areas. And same thing here. We've got a lighter tree. Our light moth, you can't hardly see at all. The dark moth stands out. When the trees got covered in the pollution from the factories, the dark moth was now at an advantage in that new environment and the white one sticks out. One of the items on Mother Nature's checklist changed and that was the coloration of the trees. And so in Mother Nature's checklist changes, we can see that sometimes the disadvantaged become the advantaged, right? Our last thing, thank you for staying with me. I know this is a lot, but I wanted to get it all in. Our, our last thing is artificial selection. This is called domestication. We talked about this in our genetics unit. This is one of the advantages. This is one of the things we use genetics for. So artificial selection means not natural. So humans are doing the selecting. Humans pick which traits are the best, right? We talked about this. I use the example of cornfields or horses, right? If a horse wins a ton of races, people will pay you a lot of money for your horse to mate with their horse because they think, I'm gonna have the next super horse that wins all the races. And it's the same thing with cornfields. If I have three different cornfields and cornfield B grows much better than A and C, well, the next season, I'm gonna fill my fields with cornfield, with C from cornfield B, because it dominated. So humans are picking the traits, which means they're picking the genes of what they desire or find desirable. All right? So humans pick who gets to mate, basically. And if we pick the ones with, you know, the so-called, I'll use air quotes, best traits, we'll get offspring with the best traits. So we see that here. Here's a dog show and all the bulldogs. And to me, the bulldogs look remarkably the same. But to someone that's an expert in dogs, they might look very different. They say, hey, this, this is the best bulldog ever. So now people will pay a premium for this bulldog to mate with their bulldog and produce super bulldogs that will not only win dog shows, but go out and solve world hunger and fight crime, all right? And of course, like we said, um, this is a picture of uh, young Charles Darwin um, setting up outside of the uh, Natural History Museum in, in England. And of course, he's, he's out there to prove, <laughs> no, I'm just making that up. I just thought this was funny. The earth is just 6,000 year, years old and it's flat to change my mind. This is a very famous meme. It's not young Darwin. You knew that. Anyway, that's the end of my talk. 
Hope it all made sense. If there's any questions, comments, or concerns, throw a question or comment in the YouTube comment section below this video. Or if you're one of my students, reach out to me through Edsby and I'll answer your question. We'll get everything straightened away. All right. Hopefully we changed your mind, but we know how hard that can be. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.